outsider, we thank you, Lord, that you are the God who made and loved us. We thank you, Lord, that you are so gracious to us. And we pray, Lord, that we would uh, learn again from Mark's gospel this morning uh, what kind of God you are. And we thank you um, for this uh, series that we're looking through. In Jesus' name, amen. Cool. Uh, Yeah, if you want to have that passage open, uh, we're going to be looking at these verses that were read out to us. Uh, Have that open so that anything I say, you'll be able to check uh, that I'm uh, I'm not telling lies, basically. Um, Just see what's going on out there. Great. Cool. Um, Well, it happened on June the 2nd, 1953, at Westminster Abbey. The 25-year-old was watched by 27 million people. It was an event that was broadcast worldwide, and it was a grand ceremony. The nation had waited a long time for Elizabeth II to have her coronation as the Queen of England. It was a where were you moment, if you're alive at that point. It was a day that would change her life forever as she sat on the throne of one of the most powerful nations in the world. A defining moment, some would say, in our nation's history. Uh, Maybe you yourself, in your life, have had some defining moments. The passage today that we're looking at has a defining moment. Elizabeth isn't going to be on the throne, uh, even though it may seem like that forever, is she? Um, The episode we're going to look at today, though, In Mark's gospel, it brought everlasting change to one man. It was an encounter with the living God who is still defining lives today as he draws his followers towards him. The defining moment was not a fancy coronation. It was was at Calvary on a cruel cross. But that moment in history... It meant that whoever trusted in Jesus, they would have their lives changed forever and they would follow a God who is everlasting. So we've got uh, two quick points for us today. The first one's going to focus on verse 13 and 14, and it says a life changed by two words. A life changed by two words. We've seen so far, haven't we, how Jesus uh, can change things, can't he? Uh, in, already in Mark, Jesus has been causing quite a stir. If he was around today, you'd say he would be the guy that is stealing all the headlines. He has announced that he is bringing good news from God. He has been baptised in the Jordan. He has battled with the devil in the wilderness. He has be- performed miracles and been healing those in desperate circumstances. And he's been making some outrageous claims. Last week we saw, didn't we, that Jesus claimed that he had the authority to forgive sins and he heals a paralytic. And in today's passage, again, Jesus does the unexpected. He does what you wouldn't expect God on earth to do. Verse 13. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and began to teach them. You see, it seemed that Jesus' ministry was now going to be more public. It got to a point where you can't stop the large crowds gathering. And at this point, we we meet one of our central characters in our story today, Levi, or Matthew, who is the gospel writer. Verse 14, as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. Now it's shocking that Jesus would call Levi, who is a tax collector, and we'll learn a little bit more about that later. Uh, They say, don't they, three words can make all the difference. Uh, Ladies usually get quite excited when they hear these three words. A lot of fellas say them begrudgingly. Uh, I don't because I love my wife, all right? So I'll be in trouble later if I did say that. But they say, don't they, the words, I love you, uh, especially on Valentine's Day, can mean a lot, can't they? Well, it's not three words in this passage today that make the difference. It's two words, follow me. With those two words, Jesus has a new disciple. Levi was called... And he followed. 
There was no, not today, Jesus, uh, I'm a bit busy, can you come back next week? There was no kind of, ah, oh, Jesus, you know, I've got a ton of work to do today, so, you know, today's not a good day. There was no kind of, well, I am really committed to that box set, can't really have a break from the telly. There was no kind of, do you know what, Jesus, I'm making lots of money as a tax collector, so, you know, let's just leave it for today, shall we? There was no making excuses, was there? Levi was gripped by Jesus and he followed. That is the power of the God we serve. In Luke 5, which is another account of this story, it says he got up, left everything and followed him. You can imagine, can't you, Levi sitting there going about another uh, normal day's work, thinking, you know, this day it's not going to be anything out of the ordinary. And then, bam, Jesus comes and invades his life. And we've got a God, haven't we? And many people in this room will testify to this, that Jesus invades the lives of many normal men and women. Whether you're looking for work, uh, whether you're, uh, you work for a bank or a supply teacher, you work for a, as a nurse or a gardener, uh, whether you've grown up in Liverpool or London or the North East or even Ipswich, uh, whether you've made a relative success in your life, or you've screwed up a million times, it's the same call, isn't it, from Jesus? Follow me. You see, a political party or a pop group can only do so much, can't it? Eventually, that political party will die out. Eventually, that pop group will split up. Eventually, the glory days of that football team will cease to exist. But the Bible, the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ, when he says, follow me, he is issuing a call that will never end. He will be with you for all your days right through to eternity. And you might say, well, do you know what? I'm happy with the football. I'm happy with the telly. I'm happy with that pop group. I don't really feel that pull towards Jesus that you do. But do you know what? Everyone in this room has or did have a cosmic problem. You see, Levi's problem of being hated for being a tax collector was not his biggest. His biggest problem was that he was at odds with the living God. Colossians 1, uh, verse 21 to 23 says this. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death, to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. You see, that's uh, any number of passages that I could pick that talk about our number one problem as humans, the problem that we don't follow the living God. We follow anything but him, don't we? And something has to happen for this to change. There has to be that reconciliation. And it was Christ, wasn't it, that brought that. He has reconciled us by Christ's physical body through death. The one person who deserved to live died. And he died the cruelest death. If you've been to church long enough, you'll know that famous passage from Isaiah 53. It says this, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our, our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each of us to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his, its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. You see, Levi followed Jesus, didn't he, uh, before the cross happened. Now for us living the other side of the cross, why would we want to follow anything other than Jesus, the man who gave his life for us? Um, I don't know if you've seen this uh, 
drama on Netflix. Um, it's called Suits, and it's about a law firm called uh, Pearson Hardman in New York. And it's all very high-powered and swanky, and they earn lots of money. Uh, me and Kaylee are only on season two, so if you have watched it all, there's about seven or eight seasons, so we're in it for the long haul, like. But uh, no spoilers, please. Um, they try kind of all different cases, so uh, they kind of do kind of criminal cases. Uh, they do kind of companies suing each other's mergers of companies, all that type of thing. Uh, but one of the interesting things about it is that there's a hierarchy that exist uh, at Pearson Hardman. So you have kind of like the founding partners uh, who are Pearson and Hardman. You then have kind of like the next ones down, which are the senior partners, um, and they kind of do like a lot of the day-to-day -day work. So you've got this guy called Harvey, um, who's the front guy there. He's uh, really in love with himself, and he you know needs a bit of knocking down, really. Um, so you've got him. And then you've got the guy who's kind of standing behind him with his head bowed, um, he's what you call an associate, so he's basically like uh, he's you know he's basically like a lackey, basically a very smart, intelligent lackey. Um, and it's really interesting when the big bosses come calling and they want some work doing. How quick the associates are to follow the lead of the senior partners. They are totally fearful and at the power of these senior partners. Um, they, they live in fear. They, they fear that if, you know, if they do a bad job, they will end up in the partner's bad books or, even worse, get fired. Uh, they never have that security of the uh, senior partner's approval. One minute they are praised, the next minute ripped to shreds. They live and work on a professional ni knife edge, and it's the partners who are the powerful and the associates who are the vulnerable. Aren't you glad today uh, that we've got a God who is not like a senior partner? That we've got a God who went to the cross for us. We've got a God who had real power, yet made himself vulnerable. And he doesn't want us to follow him because he wants that sense of power or because he's an egomaniac. He wants us to follow him because he is the God who made us in, him is, in his image and made us uh, and he loves us and he, he went to the cross for us and made himself vulnerable you see the question comes again when we know all that and we have the bible in front of us why would we not want to follow anything other than the living God you see Jesus gives us security from failure and fear we can follow him out of total security and total acceptance because of what he's done at the cross, because of his blood. You see, it's never too late, is it, to do a Levi, whatever you've done in your life, whatever your past, whatever your upbringing, it's never too late to, to do a Levi and simply embrace the call of Christ and follow him. You see, we like to, don't we? We like to uh, follow other things. We like to follow this tiny little screen, don't we, that we carry around in our pockets. Um, you know, it gives you a distracted life, all the apps. Um, but the apps and the, you know, the podcasts and the, the football scores, they can only really give you distraction, can't they? But Jesus gives an everlasting uh, solution to your problems. It doesn't mean that your problems are going to go away. It just means that in them hardest of circumstances, Jesus is with you and he loves you and he wants you to follow him. Teenagers, maybe, uh, you know, I know Instagram, I'm not on Instagram myself, I, I can't really work out how it works, but, you know, Instagram's a place, isn't it, of lots of photos, lots of shaming, lots of acceptance. You can go, I imagine, from, you know, feeling sky high to feeling very low on the amount of kind of likes you get and what the comments people put to your pictures. Well, do you know what? Jesus is so much better than Instagram. He loves you at your lowest moment and your most vulnerable. What about those of us who are blessed to be working at the moment? You know, respect and money are great things, aren't they? But they're only going to last so long. There's always going to be that next person who comes to take our job, the, the next generation. Jesus is better, isn't he, than money and respect. He gives us everlasting righteousness and security that's in Christ. 
Maybe you're fighting addiction this morning. Do you know that to come to church to follow Jesus, you don't have to sort yourself out beforehand. Jesus does that by cleaning you inside out. He does that by you responding to his word and following him. Why not go to him and and let him break that cycle of addiction today? Well, let's move on to verses 15 and 17 to 17. And this title is Everyone Needs Jesus. I wonder what your family or friends or colleagues uh, think about Christianity if you were to ask them that question. So often, don't we, we think that Jesus has come for the so-called righteous and not for the sinners. Have you ever been with someone who says, well, you know, I would come to church, but to be honest, I don't really feel good enough. Or maybe you've, um, you know, you've spoken to people who think that the church is just a place of hypocrites. You know, people who, who say that they're holier than thou, but actually lead a double life. Even if you've been a Christian a long time, we're tempted to think, aren't we, that Jesus has come for us on the basis of what we do. I give up a bit more time and I volunteer at Speak Kids, so, you know, that's probably why God's called me. I'm a church elder, don't you know? You know, and I I do a good job. I serve people. I think Jesus might have, have come for me. We can separate people into two camps, can't we? Those who we think are in with God and who look the part, and those who are out with God, who we think, do you know what? They're just really too bad. They're too messy. God would never go for them. But do you know what? We have a God, and this story shows it, doesn't it, that rips up the merit system. On that last day, when we stand before God, there won't be a league table of righteousness. There'll be one question. Do you know Jesus? And to know Jesus means admitting your need for him. Levi, with all his riches, and we're assuming he was a rich man, most tax collectors were in those days, He knew that he needed help. Verse 15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Uh, I have to admit that I I don't get round to eating at the table during the week a lot. Um, I I usually have to eat dinner pretty quickly, but uh, eating with someone in Jesus' day was an intimate occasion. It was an honour to be invited to someone's house and it was an honour an honor to have that invitation accepted. There's something about, isn't there, sitting around a shared meal, isn't there? Me and Kaylee had Frank and Pete around yesterday. It was great, wasn't it, Frank? It was great, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the lasagna was good as well, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It, it was great. There's something about having food together, isn't there, that just really warms the spirit. But there was a problem, wasn't there, with going round to Levi's house. Because as mentioned earlier, he was a tax collector. Uh, One commentator put it like this, that they were on par with murderers. That was how tax collectors were viewed. It wasn't like uh, an HMRC guy working in an office. These tax collectors, they worked with someone called Herod of Antipas, who in turn worked with the Roman Empire. Levi was working in a booth, so more than likely he was probably taxing uh, travellers, and he would have been extorting them. You see, the way that it worked uh, in, this, in this day was that the Romans uh, was sold the right to tax people to the highest bidder. So they wouldn't have the effort and the expense of going to collect the tax uh, themselves. They would kind of have a situation where uh, firms, I suppose you would call them, groups of people, would bid for the right to tax. So if Matty is not here today, I don't think, but if Matty turned his gardening business into a tax collecting business, uh, he would put in a, in a bid to the Romans, let's say a million pounds, and they would say, yep, yeah, that's fine, that beats all the other bids. Uh, you can now be in charge of taxing people in the community. And so Matty and his business would make a quota And it wouldn't be how many gardens they could fix up. It would be how much money they want to make. So they'd say, well, you know, we've we've bid one million. So this year, let's make a profit of two million. And so the tax collectors would do anything to meet that quota. They would uh, look to make that quota for the the group of people who they 
they were working for, but they'd also look to individually boost their pay. They'd try to take home extra for themselves. They would have been taxing people who were in the same community as them, maybe even people they'd grown up with. They were sellouts. They were traitors to their own people. And here Jesus is eating with them. And it says that word sinners, doesn't it, as well? Uh, These people, as I've read this passage, it's probably the people who are the community outcast, the drug addict who robs the elderly, the self-obsessed stockbroker who swindles and undercuts and tramples on the weak, the woman who works at the strip club, the man who is violent with anyone who wrongs him. You see, Jesus was at the table uh, with people who, let's be honest, we'd find it tough to be around, let alone eat with them. And maybe the Pharisees and the Jewish people uh, had Psalm 1 ringing in their ears. This is what Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockery. You see, Jews at that time, even Jesus would have known them verses, so it's surprising, isn't it, to see him here eating with those who are clearly uh, people who are on the the outside, the tax collectors, the sinners. It leads the Pharisees to ask this question in verse 16, doesn't it? When the teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, disciples, why does he eat? with tax collectors and sinners. And that's when Jesus answers in verse 17, doesn't he? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, Jesus hadn't come for people like the Pharisees who thought that they were in with God because they were so-called men of God and looked the part. No, Jesus has come for those people who know that they need him. The Pharisees, the people the Pharisees thought were out, were the people that were actually in. And the ironic thing about this is uh, perhaps the Pharisees want to split this meal up into three people, don't they? Three types of people. They want to split them up into Jesus, tax collectors and sinners, and themselves. But in reality, there's only two types of people at this meal. And we've got a little thing here that I've knocked up. Uh, It's not very good, but you'll roll with it. Okay, we've got actually, look, we've got Jesus there who's separate from everyone because he's never sinned and he's God. There's no one like Jesus. And then you've got in the other group, we've got the other type of person who are the tax collectors and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were just as sinful as the tax collectors. Yeah, their sin wasn't, uh, wasn't as out there as the tax collectors, Uh, But they were sinful. Inside, they were just as bad as the the tax collectors and the sinners. This is what it says in Mark 7, and we'll get to Mark 7 eventually. This is what Jesus said. I'll read it out. This is a bit small on the board. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery... Greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. You see, you could be Mother Teresa or you could be a lifelong crook. Both need Jesus. Both are sinful. Um, Well, I talk a lot about TV shows in my sermon, so here's another one. Um, It's quite famous. It's called Lost. Um, it's got about six seasons. If you haven't seen it, don't waste your time on it because the ending is absolutely terrible. Um, but it's about people who uh, are stranded on an island through a plane crash. Um, and it just gets a bit weird from there. There's lots of weird stuff going on on the island. Um, but early on, they try numerous attempts to, uh, to be rescued or they try to escape from the island. And none are successful. And what's interesting about this show is that regardless of the kind of people that are on there, uh, they all need one thing. They all need rescue. So in the show, you have the respectable doctor. uh, You have the lottery winner. You have the hardworking businessman. 
You have the woman who spent years in prison. Uh, you've, had, you've got a guy who's a bit of a swindler and he tries to kind of do odd, job, odd, odd jobs throughout his life, some legal, some illegal to get through. You see, the measuring stick that the people on the island had to meet was escape. And it's like that with God, isn't it? You see, none of us, however, however successful or however good we are, we will never meet God's measuring stick. We'll never meet the standards of Jesus. And as long as we think that we are righteous enough in our own minds, we will be at odds with God. You see, what God is interested in this morning is not how much money you've got in the bank, not how good your family life is. What he's concerned about is whether you think you have a need for him. Whether you are willing to say, I've fallen short of the glory of God, but I'm justified freely by his grace. Whether you're willing to say, my relationship with God is nothing to do with what I bring to the table. The only thing that I bring to the table is my sin and my weakness. God is interested in the people who know that they need grace. Wonderful grace that gives me what I don't deserve, pays me what Christ has earned, then lets me go free. Wonderful power, a new life for me to claim. Jesus the Saviour reigns and his power holds me. And imagine uh, what we would be like as a church if we were to denounce that self-righteousness of the Pharisees. If we were to be a church that know that they have need of God, that are dependent on him in every area of our lives. We'd have families, wouldn't we, that are full of grace. Families that forgive as God forgave. We'd have non-judgmental parents raising non-judgmental children. What about if we were to uh, know our need for God when we go to work tomorrow? That actually the, the colleagues that we're judgmental towards, uh, we, use, we use them difficult moments with them, maybe for gospel conversations. What about a church here? You see, uh, knowledge of God means that uh, we can uh, invite anyone through those doors. However messed up, screwed up they are, we know, don't we, that we're not as, you know, we're no better than them. We can love them well, can't we, and give them Jesus. What about all the things that we do for, uh, through the week here? Speak Kids, Rooted, Junior Church, uh, Welcome Club. If we have the mindset, don't we, that actually we're dependent on God for how them things go, it's going to mean, our, isn't it, that we are more serving and more loving towards people. One of our questions that we've had uh, as we've been going through Mark's gospel is what does it mean to follow Jesus? And I think as we come to, to, the, to the end of uh, this passage, what, we, what does it mean to follow Jesus? One of the things is a continuous dependence on him. A continuous dependence on him. Waking up every day knowing that the reason we're in Christ is because of Christ and his sheer grace towards us. I pray as a church that every day we would know that we are sinners and we go to the doctor for healing. Whether we're early on in that Christian journey or whether we've been uh, 30 years as a Christian, I pray that we, had, we would have the mindset that we continually need to depend on the living God. And let's pray now as I finish. Let's pray that he would be gracious towards us. Let me pray and then we'll uh, have our last song. Let's pray. On hearing this, Jesus said to him, uh, said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Lord, we thank you that uh, scripture is so honest about uh, what we're like as humans. Uh, we're sinful, Lord. Uh, we run away from you and we want to follow anything but you. But I thank you, Lord, that you've been gracious to us at the cross. Thank you that uh, your blood has forgiven our sin. And I pray that we would be a church that follow you. Um, I pray that we'd be a church that shows continuous dependence on you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>